Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we've got a cool video for you. We're going to go through our contract with the Navy uh, and use this to dispel a lot of rumors that are out there about uh, the donation process and uh, answer a lot of questions that we've seen from viewers like you over the years about uh, what all is covered in one of these contracts. But first, here's a word from the museum. Hello everyone. My name is John Quinesso, better known as Johnny Q on the battleship New Jersey. I am a Navy veteran, having served aboard an LSM, that's a landing ship medium, in the Asiatic Pacific Theater during World War II. After I left the Navy in 1946, I sort of lost my sea legs, but in the year 2004, I regained them by becoming a docent on board the BB-62. What an honor it is to serve and explain to the tourists about what this great lady has done for our country. When they hear that she has served for 48 years during World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the Persian Gulf conflict, they are amazed. I could go on and on about her exploits, but I will save that for the tourists. So, during this fundraiser, would you please donate to help the battleship today? Thank you. So, uh, before we get started, there is a link in the description below where you can read a scanned copy of this. Uh, it might help for the discussion if you follow along. Uh, unfortunately, with a video like this, there isn't a whole lot of footage to throw on the green screen behind me. So, uh, if, if you want something to look at while you're going through this, we put a copy of our donation agreement down there. We also put a copy of USS Iowa's donation agreement down there. Iowa uh, was, to my knowledge, the last ship to be made a museum with uh, the Navy overseeing it. And they may be the last ship ever uh, to become a museum that the Navy oversees. So their contract, uh, which was created almost a decade after our contract, uh, is slightly different. I've read them both in years past. I have not compared the two, but uh, theirs is a little bit longer and probably has some sections that ours doesn't have. If you're interested, check those out. As a rule, the older museum ships have much less strict documents. So the first museum ship is USS Texas in 1948. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's no documentation at all for that if it was just a handshake agreement. Uh, other waves of museum ships come in the 50s and 60s, and then by the uh, 90s we're seeing the final wave of museum ships, primarily the Iowa-class battleships with Missouri and New Jersey decommissioned first, and Iowa and Wisconsin following about a decade later. Uh, this, of course, I'm just talking about U.S. Navy museum ships. There are a number of museum ships in other countries, and those fall in their different things. There are a number of museum ships in this country, which are, are the result of agreements made with foreign countries. So, for example, uh, the destroyer escort Slater, which we've talked about a number of times on here. She was given to the Greek Navy following her service with the U.S. Navy. And uh, the museum acquired her from the Greek Navy. So she is not overseen by the U.S. Navy, and their agreement does not require her to be overseen by the Greek Navy. Uh, so, so they have fewer requirements than we do. Uh, likewise, Coast Guard cutters like Taney, which we've also talked about on a number of occasions, are not overseen by the U.S. Navy. They have, uh, she has a contract from the Coast Guard, which probably was uh, copied largely from similar 1980s era contracts like this one. It uses a lot of the same terminology. Uh, but again, that's, th there are other contracting powers out there besides the Navy. I believe NAVC oversees something like 40 or 45 uh, museum ships. So, uh, the museum ship donation process in brief. This is probably worthy of its own separate video, but I'll mention it briefly here. 
uh, the Navy decommissions a vessel. That vessel often goes into a reserve fleet. Sometimes it's disposed of straight from decommissioning. Uh, if the vessel goes into the reserve fleet, it's put in mothballs, and a number of things can happen from there. In some instances, it could be brought back to service. Battleship New Jersey, notably, is brought back to service three times from the reserve fleet, more than any other vessel. Uh, it can be scrapped from the reserve fleet, uh, or in a few select cases, it can be turned into a museum. Uh, this can also happen straight from decommissioning. For example, the Coast Guard cutter Taney went straight from being a muse, uh, straight from being an active Coast Guard cutter to being a museum without going into the reserve fleet. Uh, the Iowa class battleships all went into the reserve fleet and then were made museums. Organizations have to apply to acquire a ship. When a group of people get together and they say, hey, we think that uh, Battleship New Jersey is worthy of becoming a museum ship, they have to form a nonprofit. When they form a nonprofit and contact the Navy with their intent, uh, usually the Navy then puts that ship on donation hold. And there's a series of requirements that that organization has to meet before they can be given the ship. In some instances, they are able to meet those requirements within a time period specified by the Navy, because the Navy has to maintain this ship in the reserve fleet uh, until the requirements are either met or it's been determined that they cannot be met or cannot be met in a timely fashion. So, for example, the Iowa-class battleships all successfully became museum ships. Other recent uh, attempts to make museum ships have failed. For example, some of the supercarriers like Ranger and uh, Saratoga and John F. Kennedy have had organizations stood up, try to create museums out of those vessels, uh, and ultimately they were unable to meet Navy requirements in the uh, time that the Navy set forth, and all of those vessels uh, have since been removed from donation hold, so there are currently no vessels in this country on donation hold uh, and uh, are either scrapped in the process of being scrapped or, in Kennedy's case, she's still sitting here at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, but she will be towed out to Brownsville at any time. Uh, in fairness to those organizations, it has been said that the Navy in recent years has come up with stricter and stricter requirements for taking over a ship and uh, that the Navy has even move the net further down the field, so to speak, so that it, as they meet requirements, the goals get pushed back more until they're impossible. And some people have claimed that the Navy doesn't want to donate ships anymore and they're making it impossible for future museum ships. Uh, in all fairness to the Navy, there have been a number of museum ships which the Navy has given to nonprofits which have failed or are failing, and that reflects very poorly on the Navy. And uh, ultimately, that could result in these ships being returned to the Navy, uh, giving the Navy an expense that they just don't have room for right now because they're trying to operate active ships. So uh, with all that out of the way, organizations try to acquire a museum ship. In some instances, like with Battleship New Jersey, multiple organizations put in applications. The Navy chooses the what they believe to be the best application, uh, assuming that any of the applications could actually be successful and meet the criteria that the Navy is looking for. And then a contract like this is formed and the ship is given to the Navy. At that point, the vessel does not belong to the Navy. Battleship New Jersey belongs to the Home Port Alliance, which is the nonprofit that was formed to get the battleship. I should say one of the nonprofits that was formed to get the battleship. So this deed of gift, which I keep in my desk, says that the museum owns the ship. And so let's just go through it point by point. It's about eight pages long. Uh, shouldn't take too long. You didn't have anything else planned to do tonight, did you? 
So this contract is entered on the 20th day of July, 2000, between the U.S. government and uh, the battleship New Jersey, uh, the, the Home Port Alliance for the USS New Jersey, located in Camden, New Jersey. It's interesting that they specifically say the location in here. Uh, so the agreement is reached in the year 2000. The ship opens as a museum in October of 2001. So between that time, the ship had to be brought from Bremerton, where she was, to the uh, New Jersey area. And in that time frame, it still hadn't been determined which of the multiple competing organizations was going to get the ship and where in the state the ship was going to go. And uh, then the ship had to be made ready to be turned into a museum. Uh, and making the ship ready for a museum is probably something we'll cover in a future video, but it's not specifically uh, mentioned here too much. So this says that uh, 10 USC 7306 authorizes the Secretary of the Navy to transfer by gift or otherwise uh, any vessel stricken from the Naval Vessel Registry to any state commonwealth or possession of the United States. Uh, as far as I know, only states and uh, commonwealths have museum ships in this country. I don't believe any are uh, in U.S. possessions uh, or any municipal corporation or public subdivision thereof uh, or the District of Columbia, which had the museum ship Barry under operation by the U.S. Navy, but that's no longer there, uh, or for any nonprofit entity. And I believe most of the museum ships are run by nonprofits and not by their states. North Carolina, Alabama, Patriots Point, uh, I believe are all state run or at least have state involvement, but most of them, like the Battleship New Jersey, is a nonprofit. Uh, whereas the Doney has applied for donation of the ex Battleship New Jersey uh, with the indicated intent to preserve and exhibit the vessel. And whereas the Doney has agreed to the uh, to undertake the obligation to make and keep the vessel safe in a satisfactory condition uh, and for public exhibition at no cost to the government. Uh, and whereas Congress was notified, now therefore the government agrees to transfer the vessel to the Doney. Uh, so, section one is responsibility of the government which basically says government ain't responsible, government ain't given no money. Section two is the responsibilities of the donee now in charge of this former government asset. Uh, A, the donee has to accept the vessel. Obviously, the, the museum has accomplished that. You can't fill this agreement and then not accept it. Uh, not activate or permit to be activated any system aboard the vessel for the purpose of navigation or movement of the vessel under its own power, and also not activate or permit to be activated the galley for the purpose of serving meals. Food may be served aboard the vessel provided that state and local, local regulations are met. So, this is a weird one. This one uh, is basically saying the ship is steam-powered. We cannot activate steam systems. That would require unencasing the engines, which are encased for preservation as they were during the mothballing process, uh, and then lighting off that system to create steam power. And as built, just about everything on the ship was steam-powered in some way. The presses and laundry, the whistle, uh, the kettles in the galley. Of course, the bulk of the propulsion plant is all steam powered. So, this is saying you can't do that. That's pretty obvious. Uh, we cannot try to activate the ship. That is section B. It also says we can't uh, activate equipment for the purpose of navigation. So that would be things like the steering motors uh, and the helm and all of that stuff. 
would also mean, I presume, things like the radars, where if we added power back up to our radar antennas uh, and had them radiating, that could cause issues for uh, other things which broadcast here in a civilian population center that the ship doesn't have to deal with underway. So there's a lot of airports around us. There's a lot of people who like their cable TV. And uh, if we start radiating with our air search antennas, we might mess with that somehow. So that's out. Cannot activate the galley for the purpose of serving meals. The battleship has... Well, at least four galleys on it. Uh, and then other food service prep areas. And it does say that we can serve food. Um, so obviously, the only places the ship is set up to serve food from are the galleys. So, so this one is one that's not only debated on this vessel, but on other museum vessels. The, the ones that were created late enough to have this clause in their contracts. We have taken it to mean that uh, systems in the galley used for serving food are okay. So like uh, if we put warm water in the warming trays, well then we can serve food that has been prepared off of the ship, but we're, we're keeping it warm. If we reactivate refrigerators, then we can serve food out of that. However, things like steam kettles, which require steam from the propulsion plant to heat the food are not being reactivated. So some food is prepared on the ship, in the galley, in the various galleys, in accordance with uh, state requirements. But the bulk of the equipment, particularly the equipment that requires the power plant steam uh, to be reactivated, is not used. So, I've got uh, three thoughts on why this, this clause is included. Uh, one, they don't want us trying to drive their boat around. We look like a Navy vessel. So, driving this boat around, one, puts the boat in danger. Two, it's impersonating the Navy. People could mistake us for a naval vessel. Uh, so, that's out. And... There's another clause in here we'll get to later. The Navy can take the ship back in a national emergency. So if we unencase the propulsion equipment to try and get it ready, well, then it starts to deteriorate without proper maintenance. Obviously, a museum can't afford the proper maintenance, something like that. The, the federal government couldn't afford it and decommission the vessel. Uh, so then if they ever had to come and take the ship back, the propulsion equipment is deteriorated to the point it can't be used anymore, and you can't very well cut through the armor plating and replace it. Uh, I imagine food is the same way, because it would require the reactivation of the propulsion equipment, and because if we can make food on board, then we can sail the ship out for periods of time. Uh, hence, the galley requirement is just further tying our legs there. The other... Uh, thought I've heard other museum people have towards this is uh, in a normal restaurant, you know, you're using the food, uh, deep fat fryers are creating grease, you've got ventilators that are removing that sort of stuff. Uh, oftentimes restaurants are in operation for a couple of decades and then they're torn down and whole new restaurants are built in their places. Uh, Oftentimes there is a certain point at which a space is just too dirty to continue to serve from. So you've got to completely rehab the galley. And, uh, you know, a museum really can't do that on a ship. For one, the uh, stuff is part of the original ship. So if we just want to strip it all out and remove it, there, there's a clause in here that says we're not going to go around removing historic fabric from the vessel. Uh, so we can't just strip that out and put in modern galley equipment or strip it out after it's been used to a point where the space is deteriorated and needs to be stri uh, stripped out to meet health code standards. So uh, those are a couple of my thoughts on why this might be included. Uh, honestly, this is one of the few spaces in here that 
uh, I feel like is not clear enough. It probably should be twice as long as it is explaining the reasoning and and what specifically they mean. Okay, uh, section C. Keep the vessel at a safe, long-term mooring location and not permit the vessel to be towed for any purpose other than maintenance, repair, or safety considerations uh, without the written consent of the Secretary of the Navy or his authorized represent, re- representative. Prior to long-ter- long-term mooring in Camden, New Jersey, specifically in Camden, New Jersey again, the parties anticipate temporary mooring at a private pier in the Camden area. Uh, that is correct. When the, mus- when the ship was brought here, she was first taken to the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and she stayed there for a period of time. And then when it became apparent that the Camden, New Jersey application was the one that won and not any of the other New Jersey applications, then the ship was brought over to Balzano Terminal here uh, near where she ended up while the permanent pier was constructed. So it's interesting. That's something that they're thinking about and talking about in the contract. You probably won't see that in contracts for other museum ships because that's specific to this one. Yeah, so not only have they said we can't reactivate the propulsion equipment to tow this thing around, they also say, sure, sure, you got to do maintenance, tow it to a dry dock, but don't tow the thing around, pleasure cruises and that sort of stuff. They don't want this thing moving because that endangers the vessel. Section D, establish and operate the vessel on a nonprofit basis as a static public museum and memorial only exhibited in Camden, New Jersey. So again, it's saying we got to be here in Camden uh, and we got to be static. Um, Section E, maintain the vessel in a condition satisfactory to the Secretary of the Navy in such a manner that it will not cast discredit upon the Navy or upon the proud tradition of the vessel and will not allow the vessel to become a menace to navigation, public health, or safety. Uh, so, So this is saying that when we create exhibits about the ship, when we're preserving the ship, stuff has to reflect well on the Navy. Uh, maintaining the ship well reflects well on the Navy. The ship looks like she did in active service. Maintaining the ship poorly and having rush streaks everywhere and uh, parts of the ship damaged and deteriorated reflects poorly on the Navy. So they're saying we, we got to keep up with upkeep can't let it become a menace to navigation, can't sink here in the channel or break away from her moorings, Uh, can't be a public health concern. That's going to come up a couple of times, uh, particularly in reference to PCBs. So uh, that's going to come up a couple of times, particularly in reference to polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs. Um, We'll talk about that later when when it comes up specifically. But uh, it's interesting, they're concerned with health and safety, they're concerned with the vessel not blocking the shipping channel, um, and with the ship looking good and having exhibits that that don't make the Navy look bad. Section F, at its own expense, without reimbursement or contribution by the government, protect, preserve, and maintain the vessel. This is interesting. It's saying that the government will not in any way support this vessel. Not uh, initially while it's starting up, not over the years, not as there's major maintenance concerns, that the nonprofit has to be able to maintain the vessel on its own without funding. That's important. A lot of people say, oh, well, the Navy pays for you, or uh, why don't you just ask the Navy for money? The contract of us and every other museum ship that has one of these says that the Navy will not give us money. The Navy cannot afford to operate its own vessels at the levels they want, much less museum ships that don't serve the national defense in any way. Uh, So back to that comma, including the hull, Obviously, we want to stay watertight. The machinery, it's interesting that they include this. We can't run the machinery, but we have to keep it maintained. Uh, And appurtenances. I don't believe that's a real word. In a good state of repair and preservation in accordance with sound marine maintenance practice. It's interesting that they're saying sound marine maintenance practice. Ships obviously have... uh, standards that need to be maintained that are separate from buildings. One's falling out of use. All right, and the final part of uh, section F, the donee shall acquire, maintain, and use cathodic protection and dehumidification systems aboard the vessel. So the ship came to us with the uh, 
mothballing dehumidification system still on board, we have restarted the ship's climate control systems with uh, using the original ductwork and, and plumbing, but with a modern chiller and boiler for heating and air conditioning. So we do not run the dehumidification system. We are climate controlling the vessel. Uh, must use cathodic protection. The ship came to us with a uh, passive cathodic protection system, i.e. zinc anodes, which have not been replaced during the lifespan of the uh, ship as a museum. But we do have an impressed current active system built into the berth that the ship is in. So check out the video in the description below for more information on cathodic protection. Section G. Upon reasonable notice, allow the government to perform inspections annually. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And the government gets access to all of the records and documents uh, and facilities. So for a period of time, NAVC, which was administering to the museum ships, the 40 some odd museum ships that are uh, on donation from the Navy, was inspecting these vessels. And that would usually be the local uh, reserve units would come out to inspect the vessels. Um, in at least the last two years, this has not been done. And there is speculation among the museum ship community as to whether uh, NAVC still wants to be involved with these ships or if they're trying to divest themselves of them. They've already uh, made it clear that they've already given people the impression that they are not going to allow further ships to become museums. So this could be another step in them washing their hands of us, uh, or it could just be funding concerns. They have to pay those reservists, so they're trying to get up to 355 ships, but they can't uh, keep Nimitz in service past 2022. So, you know, obviously there's funding issues here. Uh, in theory, the reservists are looking to make sure that we are fulfilling our contract when they do these inspections. I've worked with these inspections in the past on a couple of museum ships, and honestly, they've been a waste of my time. Uh, the reservists, in many cases, have never been on a ship before. Uh, when I was on Constellation, they certainly had never been on a wooden ship before, which is very different from a steel ship. They have a checklist of things to look for, uh, but none of that applied to Constellation. No watertight compartments, no metal. All that stuff. Yeah, no, no engines to inspect. The local reserve units might be aviation units. They might be medical units. They, they might have nothing to do with the ships or mechanical features that need to be inspected. So I found them to be a pleasure to work with. They spent more time having lunch than they did touring the vessel, and they spent more time touring the vessel than they did inspecting the vessel. Uh, section H. Take all steps necessary to comply with any written direction or instruction that the Navy may reasonably prescribe for the protection, preservation, maintenance, and repair of the vessel. Uh, I imagine that means the reports that these inspections fill out, and then they come back to us and say, so for example, the inspection I was a part of here on New Jersey three years ago uh, said that our wood deck was rotting and we should look at replacing that. Well. Obviously, we'd already started the replacement process at that point. That was a known thing. But also, we are complying with that documentation by working towards that. Otherwise, I can't think of any communication from the Navy to the museum. Uh, theoretically, if they were notified of some violation of this or whatnot, they would communicate with us, and then we would have to comply. Uh, I comply with federal... Uh, state and local laws and regulations, blah, 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 public safety, protection of the environment, historic preservation. So yeah, that, that is saying that we are subject to whatever state restrictions, whatever Camden City restrictions. Uh, so we do have, say, the fire marshal come out and inspect us for fire safety. Uh, and things like our fire suppression systems and alarm systems and exit signage systems are per New Jersey state code. And it might not be the same on other ships. So for example, uh, we have to install emergency lighting on our tour route. That's what uh, the state requires. On other museum ships I've worked on, the ship's original emergency lighting, the battle lanterns, 
could be maintained and fulfill that. The state of New Jersey does not recognize that here. So in addition to the battle lanterns, we've had to cut holes in the ship and install new systems for emergency lighting. Uh, so again, that something they're not saying, hey, this is the list of things you have to do. They're saying, check with your local people and do whatever they say, because obviously these museum ships are all over the country. They face different requirements. Yeah, Jay is obtained license and certificates saying that we've done all this. K is do not transfer or otherwise dispose of the vessel or any part of the vessel uh, or any interest the donee may have unless the prior written consent of the Secretary of the Navy or his authorized representative has been obtained. However, the donee may sell or use the vessel's teak decking and related hardware without further authorization from the Navy. So when the ship came here, the deck was already heavily deteriorated, so that was obviously a concern. Also, from working with prior museum ships, they knew that that was a, a major concern. We are allowed to sell the teak decking and the studs to help pay for redecking the ship. We do. There's a link in the description to our online store where you can buy pieces, pieces of teak and the studs that fasten them down. Also, be sure to check our website because we sell larger uh, chunks of teak than what's normally available in the store. So uh, if you're interested in more than what's available there, keep an eye out. Um, so yeah, this is saying that we can't just cut up the ship and sell pieces of superstructure and give stuff away. Uh, should go without saying, that's also covered under agreements that the ship has as a uh, historic structure. But it's there. There have been occasions when we've had to, or when we have chosen to, uh, say, cut holes in the barbat to let people into the gun turret at a more accessible place. In that instance, we have complied by both getting permission to cut that hole and by saving the material cut out. Uh, one, that means we're not disposing of it, which would violate this. And two, it means that it can be used to patch the hole if the ship's circumstances ever change, if that tour is canceled, if uh, the Navy ever takes the ship back and has to reactivate it. And I think that comes up later on in this document as well. So uh, we do get a lot of requests from people to donate money and be given a part from the ship in exchange, a battle lantern, a locker, a piece of metal from the superstructure, that sort of stuff. This says we can't do that. And furthermore, that's an ethical issue. The ship and all of the fittings in it are a historic structure. So we can't go around stripping parts out and giving them away. All right, so section L is we require any successor in interest or manager of the vessel to comply with all provisions of this contract. I'm not sure if that specifically means uh, at the end, this is signed by who was the executive director at the time and the board president, if that means that their successors, or if it means that uh, if the Home Port Alliance dissolves, but another nonprofit forms and continues to maintain the ship here, uh, if that's what it means by successor. All right, so section M, uh, accept as provided, obtain written approval from the secretary and his authorized representative prior to any significant change in the movement, operation, use, towing, mooring, management, maintenance of the vessel and its equipment. Uh, if towing becomes necessary, the donee shall submit a towing and mooring plan to include safety and insurance requirements uh, with sufficient time for government review. Government will expeditiously review and approve, if appropriate, the plan prior to moving the vessel. So that basically means when we're gonna take the ship out for dry docking, we let them know that the ship is going to be away from its permanent moored location for a period of time. Uh, and here's the plan to do it. And so they can say, oh, yeah, yeah, four tugboats is enough. That's what the Navy would use to move this. Or you're going to have a scuba diver hold a mooring chain in his teeth and try and swim the vessel to the Navy yard. That's not going to fly. Uh, and then N, notify the Navy should the donee no longer be willing to or able uh, to maintain the vessel as a museum and memorial. If this organization goes defunct, then uh, we have to tell the Navy that that's happened so that they are aware. I don't believe they would actually step in and do anything, but uh, so that they're aware that this 
organization is walking away. All right, number three, liability. That just says that the Homeport Alliance is liable, the uh, nonprofit that runs the Battleship New Jersey, and not the government in any way. They cannot be sued if somebody gets hurt on board. Uh, if we discover something on here and would be inclined to sue them, we cannot. If somebody uh, starts suing people, the, the government cannot be sued because this vessel is being operated as a museum. Uh, number four, insurance. This largely talks about insurance while the vessel is being moved to its permanent location. Uh, but it does also mention that uh, we need at least a million dollar policy, which we have. Uh, and that it doesn't exclude us from getting a larger policy or additional policies. Uh, so section five, prior to delivery, in the event that the vessel is lost or totally destroyed prior to the time of delivery by fire, shipwreck, act of providence, or a foreign power, or by any other means whatsoever, whether by neglect on the part of the government or not, this contract becomes void and of no effect. Uh, interesting that that was included. Uh, like I said, the ship was at the Bremerton Navy Yard. It was, uh, when it was decided it was gonna be a museum in New Jersey, it was brought to the Philadelphia Navy Yard, which is another reserve basin. Uh, and there was a period of time prior to it actually being turned over to the museum during which they decided which museum it was going to be turned over to. Uh, so it's interesting that they're saying that, hey, uh, if something goes wrong, it's not our fault. Uh, so it's interesting that it includes the act of a foreign power, given that this is written in July of 2000, because in September of 2001, the country is attacked by a foreign power. So uh, the September 11th terrorist attacks, not exactly an attack by a foreign power, the September 11th attacks do play a role in this museum opening. And she was slated to open right around the time of the attack, and she did open in October of 2001. So when the uh, ship was towed from where it had been working on at the uh, Broadway terminal to here, where she is permanently displayed, uh, it was done in the dead of night, as opposed to being a big press event like had been the intention. So section six, the toxic substance section, acknowledges that uh, there may be PCBs on board and that uh, we will have a separate agreement with the EPA, which we do, which is longer than this whole agreement. Uh, but basically that says uh, that, hey, it is known that PCBs are used on vessels. Uh, before we open a space, we have to test that there aren't any in there. And, and we do meet the requirements of that contract. Section seven, uh, disputes, yeah, is, is just a bunch of legalese about uh, our, our ability to dispute things in the contract and whatnot. I don't believe there has ever been such a dispute by either side. Uh, certainly not in the three years I've been here. Uh, section eight, is an interesting section that is termination. So A is national emergency. In the event that the president declares a national emergency, the government may request the donee to return the vessel and the donee shall return the vessel to the government on an as is, where is basis. Unless the donee is notified otherwise, title to the vessel shall revert to the government immediately upon the government's request. So. If there is some sort of emergency, uh, some equivalent of a modern day Pearl Harbor attack that destroys capital ships and requires this one to be brought back into service, uh, the government can take the ship back immediately, same day. Uh, I might not even get time to empty out my office. Interesting clause uh, has never been used on any museum ship so far as I know. Check the link in the description for a video we did on which museum ships I thought would be most likely to be reactivated if this clause was ever enacted. Uh, I don't believe this clause will ever be enacted. This, uh, in a number of the videos on this channel, I've talked about ways in which uh, the ships are obsolete and uh, their equipment is 
too old to continue to use. So watch other videos in the channel to get more information on that. I, I doubt it'll ever happen, but it is interesting. We fully own the vessel, but the government can step in if it's a national emergency and take the vessel back, which means that ownership doesn't actually mean you own anything. You don't own your house. You don't own your car. The government can come and take it whenever you want, whenever they want. Much like the government can use eminent domain to take your private property, the government can use a similar clause to take my battleship back from me, even though I own the battleship according to this document. Uh, default by the donee, this is section B under termination. In the event the donee fails to perform its obligations, blah, 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 the Navy gives you 90 days to comply. And if after those 90 days, you're unable to comply, they can take the vessel back. Uh, there have been a number of museum ships which have failed to comply or which have defaulted, and the Navy has never stepped in and taken the vessel back. Too expensive. More likely that the vessel would remain here as a pollutant and uh, hazard to navigation. A good example of this is what is happening with Ling. The organization which was operating Ling failed, defaulted, and ultimately the boat sunk which put a number of toxic materials into the Hackensack River. Another organization, which the Navy was not aware of and does not acknowledge as owning the vessel, came on board and pumped water out of the vessel, including more toxic material into the Hackensack River. However, the Navy has not in any way stepped in to stop this, take over the boat, and get involved in any way. So this says that they can, but they won't. It costs money. There, there's no thought of any of these vessels ever returning to Navy control. Imminent danger. Uh, in the vessel, in the event the vessel becomes a hazard to navigation, public health, safety, or property, uh, or in the event insurance coverage is not paid or is permitted to lapse, Secretary of the Navy or his authorized representative may terminate the contract. Um, again, this is something that we have seen happen with Ling, but the Navy hasn't done anything. With the Navy's own uh, museum ship, Barry, they did scrap her when a bridge was built that would prevent her from being dry docked, which could uh, one day lead to her becoming a hazard to navigation. So uh, in that instance, the Navy owned the vessel and they towed her out and scrapped her because that was cheaper than allowing her to become an aid to navigation. The Navy sees a donation of a museum vessel as permanent as scrapping, that these ships go out and that they will never return. And uh, they, they don't actually have any plan of any of these ships coming back. Equipment. The government reserves the right to remove equipment from the vessel uh, required to satisfy fleet material needs. If they do that, they will attempt to replace it with a non-functioning thing that looks the same. Uh, that's an interesting clause that is in there. These ships were stripped of parts uh, for parts a number of times during the mothballing process, so this might just be a retroactive thing. Um, I was going to say, as far as I know, the Navy has never done this, but when the Iowas were reactivated, the Navy did go and strip parts off of the other existing museum battleships. And when this contract was written, Iowa and Wisconsin were still uh, being retained by the Navy. So in theory, had those ships needed to be reactivated, the Navy could have come and stripped parts off of Missouri and New Jersey to uh, meet their material needs. So that's an interesting contract, which I don't think will ever be... Uh, will we'll ever be called upon to provide parts for. Uh, section 10, right to approve. The government reserves the right to disapprove the nature and types of displays, exhibits, retail sales, and other activities to be installed or to take place on or near the vessel in areas under control of the donee for the purpose of ensuring that such displays, exhibits, retail sales, blah, 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 blah will not cast discredit upon the Navy uh, or upon the proud tradition of the historic vessel. So this is very similar to wording to what we saw earlier, uh, where we can't 
preserve the ship in a way that looks bad for the Navy. We can't just paint the ship pink on a whim. Here it's saying that our exhibits and the stuff we sell in the store and the events we do cannot look unfavorably uh, upon the Navy. Interesting clause to add, it does put restrictions on what we're able to do. Um, but yeah, it, require, it doesn't require us to get approval from them before we install an exhibit or hold an event or sell something in the store. It purely means that if they find out we're doing something they don't like, they can step in and tell us to not do it. Uh, section 11, acknowledgement. The donee acknowledges that it has uh, executed and furnished it to government the Navy form assurance of compliance with Civil Rights Act. Uh, I assume that's something we did way back in the day before my time. Historic preservation. The donee acknowledges that the vessel may be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, in addition, the donee agrees to preserve the characteristics that may qualify the vessel for inclusion in the National Register. I don't know if we were included on the register prior to being a museum or not, but it is interesting that they're thinking about that and that the Navy at least is aware that the register has certain material components. We are a historic structure. Certain features of the ship are what make us historic, so we can't destroy them. Um, and then section B, no construction, alteration, modification, blah, 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 shall be undertaken uh, without getting the permission of the State Historic Preservation Officer, or SHPO, uh, and the Secretary of the Navy. So again, this goes back to we're cutting a hole in a bulkhead to create easier access into turret number two for a guided tour. We had to let both the Navy and the State Historic Preservation Officer know that we were doing that. Uh, and then also redecking the ship. The next section is going to say that we're authorized to redeck the ship using the traditional methods. We chose to use a more modern method that will be cheaper. So we had to get that approved by the Navy and the State Historic Preservation Officer. And uh, upon their pr approval, we were able to do that process. So section C, the donee may undertake the following actions without prior Navy permission. Uh, any emergency action required to prevent or respond to fire, flooding, collision, or other incidents that may endanger human life or the vessel or pose an imminent threat to the environment. So if the ship is on fire and we've got to cut through a bulkhead to get in and save people or prevent the fire from spreading or whatnot, do what you got to do to save the ship. If it's destroyed by the fire, that renders the rest of this contract null and void anyway. Um, if we're repainting the hull or superstructure in the present scheme, we can do that without consulting the Navy. That makes sense, replacing like stuff with like material. Yeah, so people always ask why we don't paint the ship to look like World War II. This section is why that is. Uh, but even if this section wasn't there, I wouldn't allow it to happen because the ship doesn't look anything like she did in World War II. So she shouldn't be painted that way. And there is no way to feasibly restore this ship to her World War II configuration. And if we did, we would be destroying historic fabric from her later commissions to add facsimiles to make her look like a World War II era ship, which also is in violation of this. So all of you armchair curators out there who think that we should return the ship to a World War II configuration and take her out and sail her around, read the damn form. Some older vessels like, or some other World War II era vessels like Kidd and Slater have very successfully managed to backdate themselves uh, in Slater's instance, she is not administered by the Navy, so they can cut off and add back on whatever they want. Uh, and they're not beholden to maintain the ship in her post-U.S. Navy service. Uh, so they can just cut off all the things that the Greek Navy added. In Kidd's instance, uh, they may not be beholden to a document as stringent as this one, uh, or they may have just gotten Navy approval because with that vessel... Later on in her career, World War II era stuff was taken off, but she wasn't really, she didn't really receive major modifications like the Iowa class did or like other destroyers that were frammed did. Uh, so in reality, they're just adding back features that were lost that are uh, significant to, uh, that are significant to the ship's World War II service. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, and section four. 
uh, excuse me, and section three, temporary modifications as specified in the approved towing plan to tow the ship to uh, from Philadelphia to Camden. Uh, so that probably entails cutting down the ship's mast so she can fit under the Walt Whitman Bridge. It might also entail, uh, at a certain point during the process, the, the forward most bulwark at the bow of the ship was cut so they could run a tow chain through that. Uh, and I'm not sure if that had been patched at this point or if that was during this process. So certain modifications to tow the vessel were made. And in section four, preservation and repair of teak decks with material like in kind and repairs. So if we were doing the exact same way the Navy did it as built, we can just do it without approval. Since we're doing it differently, we sought and received approval. Section five, restoration or replacement of topside equipment or features removed during an inactivation, including antennas. So for example, our SPS 49 air search antenna was not there. Our phalanx Gatling guns and harpoon missile launchers were not there. So replacing these systems that were removed with other similar systems or even facsimiles uh, is allowed. In section six, any other actions as determined by a separate agreement that may be created by the donee with the State Historic Preservation Officer and the Navy during the life of this contract. Uh, I don't know of any other agreements like that, but it's interesting that it gives us the option. Uh, SHPO and the state may, uh, are permitted to inspect the vessel. Uh, violations of this section constitutes grounds for termination, and the donee shall provide a copy of any documentation uh, that may establish or modify the vessel's status on the National Register of Historic Places to the Naval Historic Center, uh, Building 57 Washington Navy Yard, which is where... Naval History and Heritage Command is housed. Yeah, the, the next section we have our definitions of terms, uh, how to include amendments, titles, and uh, reiterating again that there will be no cost to the government. And then we've got signatures by the Secretary of the Navy and the Executive Director and Board Presidents of the Museum. And that's the document. If you have any questions about the stuff we've discussed here, leave them in the comments section down below. I'd love to talk about this stuff. If you are aware of these documents for other museum ships, feel free to leave links to them down below so other people can look at those as well and compare them to ours and the Iowa's, which are publicly available now. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State and from, another, uh, and from a number of other organizations, including private individuals like yourselves. If you would like to support our museum and what we do with our YouTube channel, there's a link in the description for ways you can donate. Your donations already have allowed us to go, on, to go from making one video a week to making five videos a week. Remember to like, share, and subscribe so that you're notified when we're putting out all that new content. Thanks for watching.